Thank you for coming, everybody. I especially appreciate those of you who managed to make the long trip from Alberta or Boston or uh, uh, other places across the, the world. Um, that is, I suppose, one benefit of, of this virtual is that uh, all of a sudden all my friends and family are able to make it, and so I really appreciate that. So without further ado, let's get started. So uh, assuming I'm on the right screen, what I'm going to talk today about today is home robotics. In particular, I'm talking about a robot that you can buy from the store, take it home, and it will pick up your laundry, clean your room, and make your dinner, all with just a minimal amount of interaction or input. Now, of course, our robots today can't do all of this. Perception is a challenge, particularly in cluttered environments. We don't have good models for the objects that need to be used. And interacting with and working around humans is also a challenge for our current robots. And this is just with rigid objects. Cloth and rope can make these challenges even harder. So what is it about deformable manipulation that makes it hard? Our techniques for rigid manipulation work because they have none of these properties. For rigid manipulation, getting a model may not always be easy, but it's doable. And simulation can be practical for many tasks. For deformable manipulation, we can still have significant model uncertainty and even with the right model, simulation is computationally expensive. We also have infinite dimensional configuration spaces. Discretization doesn't help significantly here. We're still controlling and planning for hundreds or thousands of degrees of freedom. And finally, the systems are hyper underactuated. We can only really control the deformable object near the grippers. So, our approach is to say that what is missing is not that we don't have good control or good planning methods. Yeah. What's missing yeah. is the right representations. We yeah. need to be thinking about manipulation in different ways if we want to move from pick and place tasks to tasks like covering a table with a tablecloth. So when we think about modeling for deformable objects, mass spring models and FEM simulation or meshless models have been used in the past. These have typically been used for visually realistic surgical simulation and graphics. And many of these methods are very sensitive to model discretization, for example, FEM methods. And in addition to that, accurate simulation often requires significant computation time, and so-called real time may not be fast enough for planner and control loops. Of course, we're not the first to consider this problem. There has been work that has used traditional FEM or similar models in the past. The parameters for these models were typically given to the system a priori, and they'll typically have long run times. Local control methods have tried to avoid some of this challenge by estimating a Jacobian or a, a local representation of the movement of the grippers relative to the deformable object. These two methods here are particularly relevant as we'll be using them in the first portion of this talk. We're still missing methods to deal with high model uncertainty, and we're unable to simulate quickly. And even if we could, we would need to tune the simulator for each task and each deformable object that we encounter. Learning-based approaches have bypassed some of these challenges using learning from demonstration to observe a human performing a task and then adapting that demonstration to the robot. In addition, learned latent spaces have been used for planning. However, these methods require significant data collection before they can be used. So the central idea that we'll keep coming back to is this. All models are wrong, but some are useful. This isn't a new idea or problem in robotics. It's, it's fundamental. The question is, which models are useful, and how can we incorporate learning into the modeling and manipulation process? In previous work, learned behaviors have had some success on tasks for which they were trained. However, it's not clear how to avoid training a new model for every task. We can also look at high fidelity physics engines, which can be applicable across many tasks. However, as we said, they'll often require significant tuning for a specific scenario. Our objective is something that is much less complex, but still maintains broad applicability across tasks without needing a new set of training data or a system identification phase. These models should be easier to infer from sensor data, faster to use in a planner or control loop, and less sensitive to error in parameters, in addition to being more stable than physics simulation. <clears throat> 
So for the rest of the talk, we'll be focusing on tasks like covering the red table with the green deformable object. The first part of the task will f of the talk will focus on performing these tasks using a local controller. The question we'll be addressing is how can we decide online which model to use in order to control the deformable object? Our approach uses multiple models, switching the be switching between them as we get feedback on task progress. While local controllers can perform tasks when the starting state is near the goal in the basin of attraction, in general, we can't assume this is true. For example, if the cloth starts on the far side of an obstacle, our local controllers won't be able to finish the task wrapping the cloth around the obstacle. To address this, I'll present a method for interleaving planning and control in a way that enables efficient planning using a virtual elastic band model reduction while still maintaining the ability to do precise manipulation with a local controller in a single cohesive framework. In this framework, the robot is searching for the right basin of attraction for the local controller, learning where the controller gets stuck as the task is performed. So while this framework extends the range of tasks our robot can perform, there are still limitations. Because we're, not using, because we're using a model reduction in our planner, the plans that the robot generates may not be feasible in practice. In particular, our model reduction assumes that if the object is slack, it won't get caught on a hook. This leads to plans where the robot is overly optimistic, attempting to follow an invalid path, like the one that led the robot to have the rope caught underneath the hook here. Our solution is to learn from these types of mistakes while performing manipulation tasks by training a supervised classifier to bias the planning process away from transitions where we cannot trust the reduced dynamics. So let's take a look at the first part of this. How are we going to use multiple models for control? Coming back to the central theme, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Instead of having a single model of the deformable object, we'll use a set of possible models. In this work, we're going to be using Jacobian-based models that I talked about previously, and I'd be happy to talk about what these actually are offline or at the end. As the robot performs the task, we're going to estimate the utility of each model online, and at each time step, the robot will select a model from the model set to use and execute the optimal velocity command for that model. After we've executed the command, we'll update the model's utility estimate from sensor data and infer the utility of similar models. We'll be balancing the exploitation of high utility models with the exploration of others by formulating this as a multi-arm bandit problem. So if you're not familiar with multi-arm bandit problem, you can think of it like playing slot machines. You want to win the most money, but you don't know which slot machine has the highest payoff. So the question is, how do you determine which slot machine to play? What we can do is we can play each machine and keep an estimate of the reward structure for those machines. So suppose we've played this machine a significant number of times and we have high confidence in its payoff rate. We could exploit that knowledge and decide to use that machine to get a high payoff rate, relatively speaking. However, we might be less certain about the payoff rate of a different machine that could potentially be better than the one we know a lot about. So we may want to explore the other options and learn more about those. This is the classic exploitation exploration trade-off. So in order to define a multi-arm bandit problem, we need to answer three questions. What is an arm? What does it mean to pull an arm? And what is the reward signal? So we're gonna answer those three questions for uh, model selection. And then we're gonna take a look at three multi-arm bandit algorithms to solve this problem. Two from the literature and our extension, common filtering for non-station multi-arm normal dependent bandits. We add the D. We're gonna take a look at how these algorithms perform both in simulation and a real world experiment. I want to emphasize that both formulating the problem as model, the model selection problem as a multi-arm bandit problem and the KF MANDB algorithm are novel to our work. So let's get started. What is an arm? 
what we're going to say is that an arm is a model. It's a way of mapping the motion of the robot to the motion of the deformable object. In this work, we'll be using Jacobian-based method, so this is a linear approximation. So what does it mean to pull an arm? At each time step, we're going to choose a model and generate and execute a velocity command based on that model. Because we're using a linear model, what we're able to do is formulate this as an optimization problem so we can execute the optimal command for, for a given J, for a given model. The reward signal is going to be a decrease in task error. So task error is the uh, difference in alignment between the deformable object and the table, for example. How much of the table is covered? If we cover more of the table, we've done well. If we uncover some of the table, we've done poorly. And what we're going to do in order to, to evaluate or, or estimate how well each model can perform is use the utility of a model. It's the expected reward if we use that model at the given time t. A high utility means we would expect that this model will do well at the task at this time step. A low utility would say we don't think this is a useful model at the moment. So let's take a look at some multi-arm banded algorithms. UCB1 is a common baseline. Uh, this assumes that the distributions are independent and don't change over time. What this means is that each slot machine, each model, performs just as well now as it did at the start of the task and that we don't learn any information by using model A as compared to model B. I'll talk about why those assumptions aren't valid in a second, but we're gonna briefly take a look at how we actually use this. So we have some estimate of utility for each arm. UCB1 selects the arm with the highest upper confidence, it's an optimistic algorithm, and then chooses that arm at each time step in order to uh, then generate the optimal velocity command and get some feedback. KF man B relaxes the stationary assumption by using a common filter to track utility rather than the stationary assumption from the previous algorithm. This allows it to update the estimate of the arm based on what it sees and assumes that it can change over time. Because we're using a common filter, we're able to use Thompson sampling what that means is that we, given our estimates of the utility of each arm, we draw a sample independently for each arm from our common filter result, and then select the arm with the highest sample. KF MANDB relaxes the independence assumption. What this means is we're now assuming that there's shared information between these arms. If I play slot machine one, if I use model one, I can potentially learn about how well slot machine two, model two, performs by uh, comparing the results of each uh, action. And we'll see what I mean by that in, in a, the next slide, I believe. So we're going to use a common filter once again, but instead of tracking independent Gaussian distributions, we'll be tracking a joint distribution. So when we use Thompson sampling this time, we're going to sample from a joint distribution, and then once again, select the arm that had the highest sample. So I've talked re repeatedly about using a common filter. This is what we're using a common filter on. So we're tracking the utility, which is the expected reward for each model. We're going to assume that this utility can drift over time according to a Gaussian noise term with some covariance. And that covariance is what we're going to use to encode the dependence between these arms. So how do we do that? What we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the similarity between model actions. So if the optimal action for model I was similar to the optimal action for model J, we're gonna say that these two arms are highly correlated and therefore there's a lot of shared information. If the actions would have been very different, then we say it's low correlation and we're not gonna learn as much. So let's take a look at the experiments that we're gonna perform. So like I said, task error is the distance from the red points to the deformable object. In effect, each red point pulls on the closest green point. For our model set, we're gonna use a total of 60 different models from the types of models that we talked about before. These have different parameters that we can choose from, so we're just going to take a spread across all the possible parameters and see which models perform best for the task at the given time. 
uh, we're using a bullet simulator for these trials, but I want to emphasize that our method knows nothing about the actual physics in the simulator itself. Uh, we're just using it as a black box. So we're going to compare using single models to the multi-armed bandit methods on two experiments. First, winding a rope around a cylinder, and second, a two-stage coverage task where we want to feed the cloth across the top of the first cylinder and around the back of the second cylinder. The questions we're trying to answer with these experiments are which methods complete the task and how fast, and which multi-armed bandit method is better at minimizing regret. Regret is a way of measuring how well you did compared to the best you could have done given your options. So if we take a look at the first task, we're showing how our models, our multi-armed bandit method selects actions over time. And we can see that both methods perform well at the beginning. However, using a single model can fall into a poor local minima from which the method is not able to recover. It will continue circling like that forever. In contrast, our technique is able to avoid that local minima and is able to successfully accomplish the task. When we look at the error, we can see that all the multi-armed bandit methods perform roughly equivalently, where some single models fail and cannot complete the task at all, even though they looked very promising near the start. If we look on the right, we're showing the maximum and minimum regret over all our trials, as well as the average. And we can see that our multi-arm bandit method that is able to take advantage of the correlation between the arms is able to minimize regret better than the alternatives. This does come at a cost of increased computation budget, though. The baselines only need to evaluate the optimal action for one model at each time step, whereas our method requires computing that for all the models. We think that this is something that can be addressed with increased parallelization and other software engineering techniques, however. Taking a look at the second task, we're now comparing two multi-arm bandit methods against each other. On the right, we're able to quickly learn that many of our mo models would perform poorly, while the baseline needs to test each model explicitly to learn that it's not able to make it around the cylinder using that estimate of the Jacobian. Both methods are able to perform the task, however, ours is able to do so much faster. When we look at the error plots, we see that exact scenario play out. The baselines are able to achieve the task, however, our method is able to do so quicker in general. In addition, we can see that we're able to minimize regret better than the alternatives for this task. Again, we see something similar for computation time, but that we believe is addressable, as I said. When we move to the physical robot, we're attempting to move the placemat from near the camera to this pink square near the robot. For this particular task, all of the single models are able to perform it with varying degrees of speed, and we found that it didn't particularly matter which multi-arm bandit method we chose. Regardless, we are able to do this task with our, without any changes to the algorithm. Now, what we saw was scenarios where there weren't any obstacles in the way. And I want to motivate some of the next part of this talk by looking at what happens when we put something in the way that our models and our controllers simply aren't designed to accommodate. As you can see, the robot quickly tears the paper towel. So this is both a modeling error and a control error. I'll briefly introduce some additional work we did to address this from a modeling control perspective before introducing the global planner. So in this, I, the core idea here is something we call directional rigidity. If you think about pulling the rope to the left, the rope moves almost rigidly. However, if we pull the rope back against itself, then it's only rigid near the grippers, whereas any of the points over here hardly move. A linear approximation isn't able to capture that behavior. And so what we're going to do is introduce a more complicated term that accounts for that additional dependence on the direction that you're moving in order to predict the motion of the deformable object. In addition, we want to ensure that we make predictions that are consistent with where the obstacles are. And so we're going to update this term into a general nonlinear form that enforces the constraint that the deformable object cannot penetrate obstacles.
Now that's only part of the, the question here. This is how we deal with modeling. Let's take a look at the control aspect. The question we want to answer here is, how can we avoid that overstretch, that tearing behavior, without a simulator to tell us that this could happen? The key idea is that what matters is the state near the grippers. The geodesic between the grippers is what matters. That's where we're actually applying force. So if the object is near overstretch, we can constrain the movement of the grippers to prevent increasing this geodesic distance, which is going to prevent us from overstretching further. So first we can find the vector that points along the geodesic at each gripper, and then create a cone around each vector which constrains the movement of the grippers at each iteration. When we run our new controller on the physical robot, the baseline quickly tears the paper towel as we saw, while our new controller reaches a local minimum without damaging the paper towel. This, however, still can't complete the task, if we're in the right basin of attraction to start from, our local controllers can succeed. However, if we're on the wrong side of an obstacle, the controller is going to get stuck. We need a planner. So let's take a look at what it means to be planning for deformable objects. How can we do planning efficiently and quickly while still uh, being able to precisely position the deformable object at the goal? So the key questions we wanna answer here why not plan directly to the goal? Well, we don't have a good object model, so we need online feedback to do that precise positioning. In addition, there are situations where we don't have a good object model, and even if we did, we might not have the computation budget to use that high fidelity model in the planning loop. So what do we do? Our approach is to combine the strengths of global planning and local control using the planner to get us close to the goal and use a controller to finish the task. When should we use each part? If the controller will get stuck before finishing the task, that's when we need to plan. So what is the planning problem? The objective is to move the grippers near the target region so that the controller can then take over and precisely position the deformable object. So we're gonna plan in the space of gripper translations with the goal configuration for the grippers set by clustering the target points. It's important to note here that the cloth configuration at the goal is unspecified, and we'll talk about how we can improve that uh, as we learn more about what the controller can actually do. The challenge, however, is the constraints. We need to avoid gripper collisions, but we also need to avoid overstretching or tearing the object. So let's take a look at the standard kinodynamic approach for planning. So you have, at any given time, you have some estimate of where you can get the, the robot and the deformable object to. You're gonna pick one of these states to expand from, and then you're gonna pick an action and predict or simulate where you're going to end up next given that action. For deformable objects, it can be difficult to get a good model that allows us to do this simulation. And even if we had that good model, accurate simulation can be very slow. So the question is, how can we avoid doing this physical simulation in the planner loop while still being able to evaluate if our plans are valid, if we're going to satisfy the constraints. So what matters is those constraints. Knowing the full geometric state of the object is sufficient, it's enough to check the constraints, but it's not always necessary. If we can, uh, if we can forward propagate an approximation of the relevant part of the object without physics simulation, then we'll be able to evaluate the constraint without actually knowing where the entire object is. So for the tearing constraint, how the cloth drapes on the floor doesn't matter. However, the geodesic does. This is where overstretching can actually happen and tearing will, will happen. Now, this approximation is only possible because the object is compliant. If this was a rigid object, we would need the full state. This is part of why rigid manipulation deformable deformable manipulation need to be thought of in very different ways sometimes. So how do we actually check that constraint if we're thinking about only the geodesic? What we're gonna do is we're gonna propagate the state of the geodesic through the object between the grippers using a virtual elastic band. So if we have the initial state that we're trying to plan from, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the deformable object to just this geodesic 
we're going to do that using an elastic band type method. When we want to evaluate a gripper motion, we're then going to think about the geodesic and the motion of the grippers, and we're going to approximate that path using a series of free space bubbles. These free space bubbles are then contracted, like an elastic band, to generate our, up, our estimate of the geodesic at the new state. So that's how we're actually going to use the uh, constraint in the planner, but before I talk about more of the planning details, I want to show you how this works in the context of the full system. So we have a local controller that attempts to perform the task. However, we need to be able to predict when is the controller going to get stuck so that we know when we need to plan. We're then going to generate a plan and follow that plan until we either reach the end of the plan or potentially need to replan. And we'll come back and talk about that in the third portion of this talk. Once we've finished the plan, we switch back to the local controller and have the local controller attempt to, to finish the task. However, the planner might not have found the correct base of, an, of attraction for the local controller, so we may need to switch back to planning with an updated definition of what does it mean to have successfully found a plan, then go back to the local controller. So I've talked a couple of times about updating our notion of how the planner knows that it's reached somewhere good, or alternatively, how is the planner learning from the mistakes that it's made in the past that this is not a good place to leave the controller. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of topology. So we've been planning in the space of gripper translations, but we need to consider the homotopy of the band at the goal config. So you can think of homotopy through this example. If we start with the rubber band or the geodesic near us towards the camera, then the local controller is going to get stuck. It doesn't have any way to actually go around the obstacle. We have a different homotopy class, a different connectedness of the space on the far side of the cylinder that could potentially allow for the local controller to finish the task. However, we don't know which of these the local controller is actually going to be able to su succeed from when we first start the task. Our solution is to blacklist previously visited uh, gripper goal state bands and update our goal definition every time we invoke the planner. Ideally, we'd use a homotopy-based check. In practice, we're going to use a first-order deformation check in order to do this. The way this works is that you can think of taking a pencil or a straight edge and trying to trace out both sides of this path without picking up the pencil on either end. If you can do that without intersecting any obstacle, then you're in the same first order uh, homotopy class. Now, one of the challenges in trying to use this uh, virtual elastic band method is that we now have an augmented planning space. We have to actually propagate this virtual elastic band throughout the planner. Now, this virtual elastic band is highly underactuated. We can't actually control the entire uh, band with just the motion of the uh, grippers, and we have no steering function. So we can't assume expansiveness. Oh, in addition, we can't assume expansiveness in the full planning space. So a quick re recap on what expansiveness means. If you have a space, a path in configuration space, expansiveness means that you can take any point on that path and perturb it in any direction, and you still have a valid path. In contrast, when we're looking at an individual band configuration, that band could be pulled tight up against an obstacle, and so we're only able to move that band in a very limited number of directions. Our solution for these challenges is to use deformable compliance as a way to address the expansiveness challenge. So we're still going to be expansive in robot configuration space. We can perturb the robot trajectory anywhere along the path, the robot configuration anywhere along the path. And we're going to have compliance in the virtual elastic band space. This means that perturbing the robot trajectory doesn't cause the band to overstretch along our solution. So let's take a look at the experiments. First, we're going to start using the bullet simulator again. Uh, 
and we're going to be using a controller that's using a single diminishing rigidity model because we're trying to focus on the combination of planning and control rather than the model selection for the uh, local controller. In the first task, we're trying to cover the table with the cloth. In the second task, we have to move the rope, which starts on the bottom of a maze, through one of these two corners before reaching this configuration at the top. Taking a look at the first task, we can see that the local controller is going to quickly get stuck as it tries to move straight towards the goal. We're able to very quickly and efficiently, however, find a path around the pole using our virtual elastic band approximation. We're then going to follow this path, maintaining, uh, sorry, continuing to predict whether or not our path is still valid. It's possible that the path we came up with is an infeasible path in practice, and we'll take a closer look at that for the third part of this talk. Once we've reached the goal, the con local controller is going to take back over and finish the task doing the fine manipulation that's needed to actually precisely position the deformable object. In this example, where we see that the local controller does, is able to do so uh, immediately after the planner finishes, and we don't need a second planning phase. Taking a look at the rope maze example, we see that once again, the local controller gets stuck almost immediately, and we're able to then find a path in approximately, I believe it's 10, five seconds on average for this one, we'll see it on the next slide, and then follow that path. Now, as we go, we're still once again making, uh, trying to evaluate whether our path is still valid. And for this example, it will be. I've also set up this example so that we won't reach the wrong Hopotopy class when we reach the goal. However, the very next example will show what happens when we've set up the scenario so that the planner will make a mistake and find the wrong Hopotopy class the first trot time out. So, Quickly talking about the performance, we can see that our local control methods, including the prediction of, of getting stuck, is still within the realm of uh, being reasonable for a local controller. And our planning methods are quite efficient. In particular, we can see that our band propagation time dominates the planning time, which shows just how important it is to have an efficient propagation method during the planning process. So I've been talking about homotopy. Let's take a look at what happens when I set up the experiment so that the planner will almost certainly find the incorrect homotopy class the first time out. So the local controller is attempting to move the deformable object to the goal. However, it gets stuck. The planner then takes over and says, OK, I'll move the grippers near the goal. However, we don't know if the local controller will succeed from this, or at least the robot doesn't, but we can easily see that once again, it will get stuck. We then blacklist this homotopy class and then find a different way of getting the grippers to the goal that results in being in a different homotopy class. Once that planner finishes the plan, we then have the local controller take over, which is then able to finish the task. So this is what it looks like today on a physical robot. Uh, in this example, we're trying to move the placemat from uh, away from the robot close to itself here. We're able to find a plan. In average, it takes about 50 seconds uh, while still uh, maintaining joint limits and collision constraints and things like that. We've also set up this scenario so that the robot must keep its grippers below the hook, both to make it a more challenging planning problem and also to avoid one of the limitations of our planner that revolves around the slackness assumption that we've made. So with this plan, we're then able to switch back to the local controller and finish the task. So as I said, we have some limitations. If the, the, our planner assumes that if the object is slack, it won't get caught. In, in truth, though, that's not the case. If we think about what happens in planning, we approximate the geodesic with a virtual elastic band that gets pulled taut, and then we predict goes over top of the hook, when in practice, the cloth actually goes underneath the hook. In addition, the cloth can get twisted around the grippers, and we're also working on ways to overcome some of the perception challenges for more real-world tests. <laughs> 
So this leads us naturally into the third part of the talk, which is convenient, where we're talking about learning when to trust a model for planning. How can we avoid having the planner make those mistakes that lead to infeasible paths in practice? So I want to come back to the central theme once again. We want to refine the notion of useful to useful sometimes. We need to consider not just which models are useful, but also when are they useful. All models are wrong, but some are useful sometimes. So when can we know when a model is useful? When can we trust it? Well, we're going to say that we can trust a model when we know that it's reliable, when we have some experience telling us that this is something we can rely on. How do we know when that is? We're going to roll out plans generated using that model and train a supervised classifier on the data generated by executing those plans. How do we use the classifier? We're going to bias the planner away from transitions labeled as unreliable during planning. So to motivate this method, let's take a closer look at the planning problem that we're solving. We're assuming that the robot is kinematic, in this example, a pair of free-floating grippers, and the robot is carrying a deformable object. The planning objective is to move the robot from the start configuration to the goal configuration without damaging the deformable object, i.e. don't get the rope caught on the hook. So in this formulation, we're planning for both the robot as well as the full deformable object state. In general, this isn't a tractable planning problem either because we don't know the true dynamics F or F is too expensive for efficient planning. We have an FEM or similar. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to plan in some reduced space with approximate dynamics G. This reduced space can be hand designed or come from some a data driven process or some other technique. Here we're talking about using the virtual elastic band reduction. So instead of moving the rope around the hook, uh, sorry, the problem is that when using such an approximation, the path that is generated may not be feasible under the true dynamics. So we have a plan generated using G. However, when we execute it, F actually has the rope underneath the hook. If we continued executing, we would actually tear the rope. The question is, how can we plan using the reduced dynamics G in a way that leads to plans that are feasible under the true dynamics F? Our solution is to train a supervised classifier which evaluates each edge proposed during planning, rejecting edges for which we cannot trust the reduced dynamics. So let's take a look at the data generation process. We have some starting state of both the robot and the deformable object, but I'm just simplifying some notation here. We use our reduction function to, to get to the reduced planning space, and then we generate a plan using our dynamics G without any classifier. We then are able to roll out that plan using the true dynamics, and then we can evaluate what would the true reduced state have been if we knew the perfect transition function. If we compare the prediction during planning to what actually happens during execution, we can then get a better understanding of whether or not our dynamics are reliable. If we started close, if the two virtual elastic bands were similar, and we ended close, then G is reliable in this situation. Otherwise, it's not. Now, this is a conservative assumption. It requires that, the, that we are close on both ends. However, if we, re, if we weren't so conservative, we would end up with uh, a much harder classification problem in general, because it actually becomes a very unbalanced problem. And can allow for transitions, more transitions that are invalid. So when I say close, what we mean in this context is we have the Euclidean distance between our virtual elastic bands is less than some threshold, and they're in the same first order homotopy class. So one of the things about this is that there's a fundamental loss of information that's happening here that makes this a uh, potentially ill-posed classification problem, which is why I'm using the words reliable and unreliable. 
So if we consider an example with an Ackerman car with uh, standard Ackerman dynamics, we have the position and orientation, steering angle and velocity, and we use a model reduction that just has position and orientation. So we're going to pl plan with dynamics that are strictly kinematic. You can go, when you're commanded to go somewhere, you end up there. However, the full dynamics has a controller that attempts to reach that commanded, config uh, commanded position and orientation given the starting state, which includes velocity. So if we think about the situation where we have some starting state with three different velocities, but the same position, and we have a controller that's commanded to move here, in this circumstance, it might not matter what your velocity is. For any of these three velocities, the local controller is able to achieve this configuration. If we consider another scenario there, where you have, once again, three different starting states that all have the same position, and we're commanded to move over here, Depending on your initial velocity, the local controller may or may not be able to reach this state here. It might collide with this obstacle if it were to continue. And so we need to make sure that we capture that in our labeling function. And that's what we mean when we're saying conservative. We want situations like this to be labeled unreliable because there are certain states where we can't know the velocity, so we can't rely on our model, our reduced dynamics, to be accurate. They might be sometimes, but we're going to be conservative and say we want them to be reliable all the time if we're going to trust this edge. So let's take a look at the classifier that we're going to use. We're using a VoxNet-based classifier, which uses a voxelized representation of the world. So we have the local environment around the transition in white, we have a 3D rendering, the virtual elastic band, both before and after the transition in red and blue. And we're going to use that as the information that the classifier has access to during the classification process. So for training data, we've generated approximately 4,000 plans that come from uh, trying to uh, perform this task here, where we're trying to move the rope from here past a hook through a narrow slit, and to this point in space here. Now, this generated approximately uh, 550,000 transitions, of which 10% were held out for validation. Uh, I want to emphasize that we trained only on this one environment, but we're going to use the classifier in multiple environments that we've never seen before. In particular, this experiment here was set up adversarially so that the hook and the slot are right next to each other, which makes for a very challenging planning process. So let's take a look at that first experiment and see what happens. So as we can see, the planner that is not using a classifier is able to very quickly find a plan. However, that plan is infeasible in practice. We see that this planner making the same, is making the same mistake again and again, unable to make it past the hook. I've actually never seen the planner without a classifier actually succeed at this task. When we look at the success rates, we can see that using a classifier option is beneficial. However, this does come at the cost of longer planning and smoothing times. Uh, that's to be expected, given that for each edge, we're actually doing a lot more work trying to evaluate, is this a valid edge? Looking at the second example, we see that without a classifier, the planner can move the grippers close together. However, this doesn't prevent slackness from being a problem. We still have to account for that slack material. With a classifier, we're able to avoid that mistake. While the framework in general is still able to perform this task, it did require an extra planning phase without the classifier. Looking at the success rates, we again see that using a classifier leads to a higher success rate, though the gap is not as large as it was for the previous example. When we put this on a physical version of the same experiment, we can see that when using a classifier, the planner moves the rope further away from the hook, while the planner without a classifier is less conservative and the resulting trajectory is infeasible. So 
at the, at the outset, we were trying to answer two questions. Which models are useful? and how we, can we incorporate learning into the modeling and the manipulation process. In the first part of this talk, we focused on choosing between models for a local controller using a multi-arm bandit approach. This enabled the robot to learn which models are useful as we perform the task, rather than needing to collect data before, before performing any task. In the second part of this talk, we focused on how to combine planning and control in a way that addressed limitations of local control and enabled efficient planning. In this framework, the robot explores starting states for the local controller, learning where the local controller gets stuck as it performs the task. In the third part of this talk, we explored a technique for addressing the limitations of planning with model reductions or approximations. This enabled the robot to learn when it can rely on predictions of a model in order to bias plans away from unreliable transitions. So by thinking about models not in terms of how correct they are, but rather focusing on the utility of models, we've expanded the capability of robots to perform interesting tasks without relying on high fidelity modeling and simulation. So we've opened up some potential new avenues of thought and research here as well. One of the things to think about is how much do we actually need to model to do useful tasks? Let's suppose that you could allow your robot to spend some amount of time exploring before any tasks are performed. What are the things it should figure out first? What are the most important things that it should explore before it then starts to make your dinner or bring you some tea? That said, where does it come up with the model reductions and approximations? How should it decide which are the appropriate representations for each task? What matters? How can we know this? Uh, we had engineered a model reduction that worked well for our tasks. However, that reduction will have some limitations that we don't know the limits of. In addition, how can we combine these ideas with hierarchical task and motion planning techniques that would try to combine many different representations or many different ways of thinking about the task and many different skills together in, into a cohesive whole? How can the robot autonomously decide which skills it should use and when? So before I finish, I thought we should have a mental health break. So I just want to say this is my daughter from Friday night. Uh, she is just starting to walk on her own, and she's a joy. I just want to point out just how happy she is about falling down and sitting on her butt. It doesn't seem to matter which direction she falls either. I love it. It's great. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and I thank everybody for sitting quietly with your mics muted, and uh, I'm happy to, to turn everything back over to Dimitri.